Okay. Great. It happens. And you know, that's going to happen even when you do your, your trainings, know that something's probably not going to work or something's going to go wrong or <laughs> it's to be expected. And it's how you handle it is how, you know, whether the, um, the training goes, continues to be successful or not. I've had things where you know, PowerPoints don't work or this or that. I always go with handouts just in case. Always have a backup plan. Technology is okay. very predictable. Exactly. So um, in our book, I'm probably going to skip this for now, managing groups. And we're going to come back to this. We're going to come back to this. I wanted to start to talk about putting together our tutor training. And we talked a little bit about the pro-literacy concept of creating your content in modules or blocks and knowing about how long that module or block would take to teach so that this way you could even switch them around or you can change it up. Um, so I really like that pro-literacy trainer concept about the blocks and the modules. And I just wanted to point that out again. So do you or are you currently using some kind of an introductory PowerPoint or an introduction for your literacy program? Or is that something that you need to put together? Now I've seen programs where they have an introduction module and they do that at the new tutor training. And I've seen other programs that do their introduction module at a separate training. I've seen both. I always like to do it as part of my new tutor training. I don't have them come back. I don't have them come first to have them see the, the orientation. And then I don't have them come back for the training. That's just my personal preference. Um, but I thought I would share with you an example of an orientation to a literacy program. So some of the things that you probably want to include, you know, of course we talked about um, introductions, you know, who are the key players in the literacy program. Uh, I always put a definition of literacy in my overview, and I'm gonna show you an example. I always include statistics. Um, I think it's really powerful to show world statistics from pro-literacy, uh, US statistics from pro-literacy, uh, state statistics. And then I always like to say, and let's talk a little bit about um, what's going on right here locally in our own backyard. And then I talk about local statistics. I kind of break it down, world, US, state, local. Then objectives of the literacy program, or I have, I, sometimes I have a slide and I talk about great things about our literacy program. It depends on the group who I'm going to speak to. If um, it's a new tutor, I have one that I'm gonna show you that I do for new tutors. Sometimes I will change it up depending on who's going to be in the room. Um, if let's say for example, I think I mentioned on Tuesday, we've always done something like a leadership academy uh, or a citizenship academy, uh, I'm sorry, not a citizen, a citizens academy, citizens academy. And this was just a local idea where leaders in the community would get together to know more about, um, uh, you know, government resources. And so I always did a presentation to them. So you can change up your um, introduction or your orientation to the literacy program, however you see fit. If you wanted to add statistics or you wanted to add how many learners are waiting to be served. You know, those are things you can also put in there. Um, you might wanna talk a little bit about the history of your literacy program. Is it brand new? Um, you know, what are your policies? You might wanna share some learner outcomes and some stories. You may want to take, if you're in your facility and you have resources there, such as, uh, you know, I always worked out of a public library we would literally walk everybody over and show them this is the, these are the meeting rooms. Um, these are the different resources that we have available to you. This is our adult literacy section. And then 
uh, overview of what to expect for that tutor training workshop. In the Google Share Drive, I have put a curriculum literacy model that was written by Newman in 1980. I literally called it a curriculum literacy model in our share drive. When we first started um, the literacy program, and I'm talking about the one now in Citrus County, Florida, I think it was, I should remember now, I think it was, well, it's over 15 years. I researched literacy models. I literally did interlibrary alone and I ordered all these articles and I read about different curriculum literacy models for adults because I thought it would really give our program credibility to say that we follow a, an established curriculum literacy model. And I really truly, truly think the Newman model is excellent. And I'm gonna tell you why but I put the model in there for you to read. It's kind of lengthy, but I put it in there for you to read. It really focuses on the individual needs, which helps when you're doing goal, goal formation. So you really want to find out what the need of the learner is, come up with the goals, and um, it focuses on the interests of the learners. Uh, one of the other things they mention in that article is the word recognition strategies, which are the sight words, the phonics, the context clues, the word parts, and the word families. Now, the sight words, you, it, you may have heard of sight words before. And um, sight words are usually lists of like 200 words or 300 words. Sometimes they call them dolch, like D-O-L-C-H. Sometimes they call them service words but they're like frequently used words that a learner should be able to read and recognize in about three seconds or less. Now, if any of you use the Lit Start book, it has three lists in the back of that book of sight words. It has a beginning, an intermediate, and an, and an advanced sight word list. And whenever I work with the tutors and I use Lit Start, I recommend that as one of the first things that they do with their learner. That's why I do like the Lit Start book. Um, it's not the only book that I use, but it's the basic um, book that I use with the tutors and a new tutor training. So that's what sight words are. Phonics is being able to see a letter, being able to recognize a letter and knowing the sound that's attached to that letter. Knowing that the letter T is a T, knowing that the letter, uh, you know, M is mm. knowing, you know, being able to point to that letter and sound out that letter. That's what phonics is. Context clues is kind of like um, where you can kind of fill in the blanks. You see uh, some text and you're able to make sense of the surrounding text and fill in the blanks. What's that show? Is it, uh, is it it's not Jeopardy. What's the show I can't think of right now? Wheel of Fortune. Thank you. Thank you. That's exactly what context clues is. Wheel of Fortune. Good job there. Thank you. Uh, word parts is, you know, knowing your prefix, your suffix, your base word, being able to put them together. I will tell you, yes, I teach the word parts a little bit in a tutor training, but that's when the tutors get that glazed look in their eyes. <laughs> that it's a little much knowing what root words are and suffixes and prefixes. Um, sometimes that can that part can be overwhelming. The word families, I love that as a way to build up vocabulary quick. Um, when I showed you the language experience approach Tuesday, late Tuesday, if you were still with us, um, I showed how you can take a word and just change out the first letter, like the first consonant. Like let's, for example, the ENT family. You have B, bent. R, rent, D, dent. You know, so you can just change out that first letter and you're building a big vocabulary. The word families is a great way to build up vocabulary quickly. And so that's what this curriculum literacy model by Newman suggests, which is why I think it's a great one. 
Um, learner outcomes and stories, you know, are you, that's one of the reasons why I really like the giving the um, certificates. I have the tutor tell me that their learner reached a milestone and we will make them a certificate and then the tutor can give that to the learner. And we record those outcomes and things. And this way you will have, um, you know, it's hard. It is hard to show gains in adult literacy programs, especially if you're not doing a lot of intake assessments. But I think it's always good to capture those milestones. Like if they got a driver's license or they got a new job or they got a promotion or, um, you know, they were able, they even, they came to 10 sessions. They got a library card for the first time. Whatever it is, you know, they can write their name. Maybe they, maybe they are from a country where they don't use, um, you know, they use different types of writing like ideographic symbols and they needed to learn how to write manuscript letters. Maybe they're writing their letter for the first time, their name in manuscript letters for the first time. So those can all be great milestones and achievements. And they can also make great stories and outcomes that you can share. Financial literacy is another one, health literacy. So do we want to talk about this for a couple of minutes? Um, you know, what kind of information about your literacy program do you want to include in your orientation? What kind of information about your literacy program do you want to include in your orientation or your new tutor training? You know, have you talked about where they're going to meet? Are they going to meet in a public place? Are they going to meet in a library? Are they going to meet where you're, you know, your main building of your organization? Um, you know, do, will you permit them to meet at each other's homes or is that a definite no-no? You know, so we've had learners that have even met in their nail salons. We did, we've gone in and done English language in the nail salons um, or in the, um, the restaurants. So those are things that your program probably needs to firm up because the tutors will ask you this. Um, how about reporting? Will you have your tutors report to you on the progress that their learners have made? What kind of a basis? Is it monthly basis? Do you have some kind of a reporting form? Is it online? Is it paper? You know, um, do you want to school, school your tutors and what to report to you? Is this an, is this an area that you need um, to work on? Is this, do you have an orientation to your program? Do you have all your, you know, do you have your tutors sign an agreement how long they will stay with your, uh, do you have your learners sign an agreement how long they will stay in your program? I think I did share those on the Google Share Drive. I put some samples. Um, we usually ask for a one-year commitment from a tutor especially if we're giving them the materials. I will say that even when you get a materials grant from the Floor Literacy Coalition um, and you can request the materials from them, I let them use the materials at the training, but I actually don't let them keep it until they're matched up. So once you're matched up, then you'll get your, your copy of your Lit Start. In your book on page 29, um, there are some pro-literacy statistics in there. They actually have some great, uh, I think I actually, I think I put it in here. Yes, this is actually in your Google Share Drive as well. This is kind of tiny, but it's in your book, but it's also in the Share Drive. You know, they really have some really great talking points. Uh, Proliteracy does, you know, worldwide, there's 750 million illiterate adults, you know, um, you know, in Florida, 2.6 million or 20% of the state's population are lacking those basic literacy skills. 
it's just good to have those those numbers. Um, when people hear those numbers, they're usually shocked. There's other resources too that I use, um, and I, I have them in different PowerPoints depending on um, the subject content. But one, for example, is every nine seconds, uh, somebody drops out of high school in the United States. So th there's some really powerful, I know in Florida, pretty much, it's almost like one out of every four people is functionally illiterate in Florida. That means they can't read a street sign or a food package label, or they can't read a letter that was brought home from their child's teacher. So those are, those are some examples um, that I would use in a, in, a, in a training or when I'm giving an example, a talk. Let me just see here. Okay, I'm going to share um, a, a PowerPoint that is one that I would use. So let me go ahead and bring that up. Okay. Are you seeing that or no? You're not seeing that. Let me try that again. Let me try that again. Okay, I think now you're seeing that. Okay, does everybody see that? The, uh, it's like blue and orange. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, good. So this is an example of one that I've used at new tutor trainings. Uh, now this was my previous uh, employer in Florida. And I mentioned, I usually have a literacy definition in there. You know, basically I think it's important to point out that literacy is what you're able to function in society. That's, I love that term in there, function in society. To achieve one's goals and to develop one's knowledge and potential. Then I have a world literacy fact. You know, 785 million illiterate adults from pro-literacy. Then I have a US literacy fact. You know, 36 million or 29% of the country's adult population over age 16 are lacking that basic literacy skills. And I don't have to say that, um, you know, with low literacy, you know, comes often comes unemployment. One of the pro-literacy facts we talked about yesterday was for every 100 hours of instruction, you earn 10,000 more. Pro-literacy says for every 10, for every uh, 100 hours of instruction in a literacy program, they earn 10,000 more. And then a Florida literacy fact, mentioned the state fact, you know, we have the third lowest adult literacy level behind California and New York. And pretty much 2.6 million of the state's adult population are lacking those basic literacy skills. And then 14% um, or over two and a half million, they don't have a high school credential. And then I, here's where I would talk about our program specifics. You know, one in four people in Citrus County was functionally illiterate. 21,000 adults did not have a high school diploma. We were getting requests from learners. We were getting referrals from community organizations. And one of the library's core values is to advance education in the community. And then I would talk a little bit about how we help learners. We do one-on-one -on -one tutoring. We do reading and writing instruction. We do English language instruction, citizenship classes, pre-GED classes, and career online high school. And then, you know, depending on who I was talking to, I might, might put the slide in or might not, but great things about our literacy uh, program was a learner-centered approach. And I always mention that we did use 
the literacy curriculum model by Newman from 1980. And we use the Lit Start book and it's free. And we respect privacy and confidentiality. And it's a one-on-one -on -one program. Um, you know, we have goals. Uh, when we have small classes like pre-GED classes, we would have a high uh, tutor ratio and small class size. And that we always focused on making the lessons relevant, making the lessons relevant to the, um, to the learner. And by the way, this actually is in your Google Share Drive, just so you know. This PowerPoint is in your Google Share Drive. And then these are some actual learner goals. Um, you know, I just want to be able to read a newspaper headline like everyone else. I want to be able to read a package label in the supermarket. I want to be able to read a street sign. I want to be able to read a recipe and bake a cake from the box. I want to be able to read a magazine. I want to be able to read like everyone else. I want to be able to read a book to my child. I want to write a personal check, or I want to shop and talk with salespeople. So you can actually keep, uh, you know, a list of learner goals, um, and these are actual learner goals that we've helped people in the past. I had a gentleman. This is a true story, who called our library one day, and asked for the literacy department, and I spoke to him, and he was in tears, literally, over the phone. And he told me he was new to the area and that he was constantly getting lost and he didn't know how to read it. He couldn't even read a street sign is what he said to me, his exact words. I can't even read a street sign. And I, and he's like, I need help. So that's where we put that. I put that in there because he wanted He said to me, all I want to know is how to read a street sign and I can't. Why pre-GED classes? Because every nine seconds in America, a student drops out of high school. Here was an example of um, a, a successful learner that we had. So like I said, sometimes I put these in, sometimes I change it up. So this is an older one that you're looking at. And then I love to put in a local slide of community support funding and grants, because I think people are always amazed to see who supports this library program. And if they see that, you know, they may be willing to support as well. And I always explained how the literacy program, first of all, would never have gotten started without the Florida Literacy Coalition, because they gave us, they sent us a trainer and they sent us the materials so that we could have our first tutor training. And then Black Diamond Foundation also gave us quite a bit of materials um, when we first uh, started. But these are all the people that have supported our literacy program uh, over the years, the one in Florida. And we did, um, actually, you can read this. I wrote, I wrote about how to hold a tutor training and the Florida Literacy Coalition still has it on their website. And in 2010, they gave us this award for that. It's still up there today, you can read it. And then we've had quite a few outstanding literacy volunteer uh, of the year. And our joke in Citrus County was that every three years, one of our tutors will get that award. You can see the pattern there. It was like every three years. <laughs> so um, if you're not aware, the Florida Literacy Coalition does have different awards that you can apply for. Um, and they usually announce the winners at their annual conference. And, you know, some of these people were just amazing um, that have helped us over the years. And so, yeah, you might as well brag about it, right? If you, if you win the award, you might as well brag about it. So, and then we would have our contact information. So what questions do you have so far?
I don't have a question, but I just came across a new term, emergent reader. Um, we have societies that do not have a written language, so they are non-readers. But people who live in a society that has a written language, but do not read that language or do not read that language well, are now can be called emergent readers rather than illiterate. Illiterate has okay. gathered such a reputation as being dirty and homeless and lazy and all kinds of extra baggage on that term. So I'm very happy to have emergent reader available just as learner is more respectful of our adult students than student is. I like that. I like that a lot. You know, it's funny because um, sometimes in this particular slide, I did not have it, but one of the slides I actually like to use is I have a slide up that explains adult basic education, and I have a slide that explains um, English speaker of other languages. Like I explain the difference between ABE and ESOL, which by the way, you do know that ABE, adult basic education, is considered um, not a nice term. I didn't know if you knew that. In fact, the research has shown, you know, you're if you have a 22-year-old like I do, you know, that's so basic. Basic is like an insult if you're basic. So um, what do they use instead? <laughs> well, we still use adult basic. We still do. But just keep in mind that your your learner may not like that term. Yeah, they found they did I would, some research on it. Why couldn't you just say adult education? That's yeah. very there you go. And everybody, I mean, we have adult education locally, and it can be anything from making a cake to GED. It it covers everything. So I don't see any need for basic because yes, if you're an adult, you know a lot. You, you know, you have prior knowledge that we need to activate. Yes. And and put it into writing kind of a thing. So, and I think somebody asked that other term was emergent, yeah, like emergent. emergency, but with a T instead of a CY, emergent. That's that's a great thing. So sometimes when we talk about, um, you know, the ESOL, I will sometimes make fun of it with the term. I'll talk about terms. Like I cannot stand the term LEP. Have you heard of the LEP? Sounds like a disease. The limited English proficient. It's awful. A limited English proficient. So I, you know, I guess I grew up with LEPs in my family because we were we were limited English English proficient. So I like to sometimes tease the tutors about that. I said, let's try to call them ELL English language learners. You know, we're not going to call them LEPs. <laughs> you know, um, the other thing is, you know, ESL is actually not politically correct anymore because English is not their second language. Some of these learners are brilliant. These learners know more languages than any of us here. Sometimes they speak three, four, five languages. So that's where the ESOL came from, the English speaker of other language. So I love ELL, English language learner. And I, I you know, Faye, you got me thinking today, I'm only saying adult education going forward. So there you go, I learned something today. We're gonna do adult education and I'm gonna do ELL English language learner. But it, it's interesting. It's interesting. But I, I will sometimes tease my tutors, let's not call them LEPs, you know, and because, uh, you know, we have to keep their attention during a tutor training, right? So good conversation. Good conversation, guys. Oh, are we stuck? I'm not. You're not. Yeah, I'm not stuck. Okay, good. Okay, then I thought we would take a look. Just looking at our book real quick. I thought we would take a look at some uh, agendas. Let's take a look at some of our agendas. I'm going to share this. Okay. 
Let's see. Okay, can everybody see the new tutor training workshop agenda? Okay, so what I've put, I've actually put this in the Google Share Drive and I've had a, quite a few people tell me they would like to see an agenda and exactly what we do at a tutor training. So I've got it here. So I'm just gonna scroll down for a minute. So this is session one, this would be day one and this could be like a 10 to four, um, my tutor trainings are usually two days, 12 hours. Pro literacy recommends 12 hours. Um, that's not to say you have to do 12 hours. That's just the best practice. And you certainly don't have to do it two days. I've seen some people where they do it three days or four days, or they spread it out. They make you know, shorter blocks. I just This is just what I like. To me, I'd rather put two days into it and be done with it. That's the way I like to do my tutor training. I don't want to make, I feel like having people come back three and four days, you know, might be more difficult. Um, but I also always did the two day because sometimes the Florida Literacy Coalition was sending me to another county and I was going to do their training for the two days. And of course I'd have to stay in a hotel for a night. So that's, that's where that came from too. So I will show you. Um, and I, sometimes I will put the date on it, but also more recently, I just say session one or day one, and then I can reuse them if I want to use this again. So here's, this is what I would give out to a tutor. I would give this out to a tutor on day one, you know, registration. I'm going to, I'm going to show you the trainer version though. Um, so take a look at this. This would be day one. Here would be day two, but I'm going to show you the trainer version. Okay. And then here is day one, but this is the trainer version. So you can see the difference here. I just wanna show you again. The, the simple agenda for the tutor looks very clean. I don't have times on it. I don't have page numbers on it. It's very clean. The trainer version, I have names, who's gonna be teaching it about the time, length of time. I have the page numbers. Um, that's how I like to do it. Now, if you have, I have done trainings where we've had like three people doing the training and then we'll literally just change out the name. We'll say, what part do you want to do? What part do you want to do? And we'll just put the name in. If you're, you know, a one man trainer, well then of course you won't be able to have somebody to bounce the ideas off if you're just the one man trainer, which I am right now, actually just the one man trainer here in Connecticut until I get a great volunteer. Um, that would be, you know, of course, but it still helps to know the time. It's still, it's nice to have some kind of a game plan, so to speak. Um, and if you're comfortable working with your colleagues and your other trainers, one thing, if, if you, you have to agree, you won't take offense to this. You have to agree as trainers that you're there for the greater good and you won't take offense to this. If the other trainer stands in the back of the room and gently points at their watch so that they know if they're kind of going over. <laughs> and that's not always the presenter or the trainer's fault. You know, sometimes there'll be a lot of questions and, you know, we have to guide them back on. But, um, you know, I would say as long as the trainers agree to that, it's a, it's a good practice, a best practice to just try and keep each other on track. One of the other things that I like to do is when I'm working with another trainer is if, let's say, for example, Let's say, for example, I did this. Um, I did. Uh, I did this language experience approach, okay. And when I'm done with it, I might turn to my colleague and say, "You know, Janet, did you have anything else that you'd like to add?" You know, this way, if I've forgotten something and Janet, you know, had something that she wanted to add, she could, and we would still look like we're a team and that we're we are respectful of one another. You know, so I think that's really important is over the years, I've gotten a lot of comments on the evaluation, how we worked well together, or it looked like um, we each contributed something and we worked well together. 
you know, it, I've even had people say we were like a well-oiled machine and, you know, that type of thing. So you want to look like you're working well together. You're working in conjunction with one another. You know, um, you're not interrupting, you know, you're not interrupting and saying, well, Janet, you forgot to say, you know, so-and-so, you know, no, we wait till the end. And then if the one trainer says to the other trainer, oh, you know, Susan, did you have something you wanted to add? Then I could say, yeah. Or, or I would say, no, Janet, that was awesome. Or no, thanks. You, that, you've covered everything, you know, and um, it, it remains a positive experience for all. So this is, remember, this is a, as a trainer, this is a guideline. So trainers are supposed to be flexible. Okay. And we may go over here or take away from here, you know, but this is just a general guideline. I think one of the, when I've seen trainings before, I can't stand if the trainers are not prepared. If, if um, we don't have everything set up when the participants arrive, if we, um, you know, if we say it's going to be a 10 to four training and we're letting them out at one, that doesn't seem right. If we say it's a 10 to four training and we're, we're saying, oh my gosh, we have to keep you till five. That's not right. That's not a professional training. So I find this is a great best practice to do just to have some kind of an idea um, about how you're gonna be spending the day. Now we can look at this a little bit more in depth. So, okay, so the registration welcome, Remember we talked a little bit yesterday how you want to explain you know, who you are, what you do, why you do it, who you are, what you're doing, you know, what's your role in literacy, why is literacy important to you, and don't forget to state your credentials. You've been a tutor for 10 years, or you, know, you studied, uh, you were an educator, or whatever it is. Um, you wanna share that, and it's not bragging. Then we, I showed, I just showed you the program um, overview. I showed you a little bit of a literacy from Citrus County, um, some slides there. We went over some statistics. We went over some world. We went over some U.S. statistics, some state statistics, and some Florida statistics. Okay, now we have the objectives workshop goals. I'm gonna. This is actually in your Google Share Drive. This is in your Share Drive as well. Here's some examples of the workshop goals. We're going to understand, you know, how our organization, um, you know, we're gonna understand our organization's literacy initiatives. We're going to understand how adults learn. We're going to take a look at the characteristics and the needs of adult learners. We're going to understand cultural differences and learning difficulties. We're going to understand the roles and the responsibilities of good tutors. We're going to learn techniques to teach reading and writing. We're going to learn techniques to teach English language skills. And we're going to acquire the tools to create lesson plans. And we'll get familiar with the tools such as the Lit Start book. I'll have handouts, books, and online resources. So my best practice is to leave this up on a wall. If you have a whiteboard, or if you can write this out and put it up on, you know, a big white poster paper and leave it to the side of the room. The reason I like to leave this up, even though we did give you a slide, there is a slide in there of this as well. I like to refer to it, especially on day two. I'll remind them. I said yesterday we took, we learned how adults learn. We did the learning styles. We did the, you know, multiple intelligence or whatever it is. And I, I like to refer to the whole list. Uh, back and forth, what we've done. We've done that so that they can see that we've actually done what our objectives are. The other thing I like to do at a new tutor training is once I have this up on the board or on the side of the room or wherever I leave it up, I like to look at the participants, the potential tutors, and I like to say, is this what you expected? When you signed up for, for this, is this what you expected? And usually I wait and I look to see, and usually I'll see the heads nod. And that's a good thing. 
If they're not nodding their head, then they're thinking, uh oh, what did I get myself into? Because remember, we want to train the tutor, but we also want to retain the tutor, right? We want to train and retain, right? So, um, and some people will not want to do it. Some people will say, wow, this is more than what I bargained for. Um, and that's where the continuing education uh, comes in. That's definitely one way to try and retain your, your tutors. So is anybody else doing this with their training workshops or is anybody as um, structuralist <laughs> as I am and have to put all their minutes down and all their <laughs> and all their names and how long we're going to take, but it really does help, especially if you have multiple trainers. It definitely helps. I, like I said, I've actually done training workshops with like three other people where there were four trainers in the room. And sometimes it's nice because you, you can know as a trainer, oh, okay, I can actually skip out for 30 minutes if I need, or I could skip out for at least 15 minutes if I need to. You know, so it's kind of nice to know that. Um, you don't want to do it all the time, but um, if you had to, you could. So what questions do you have about what we just talked about? Yeah. <laughs> Is the, um, the list of objectives and workshop goals that you have um, also the order that you would like to present those things? It, it is. It is for the most part, yes. Okay. When um, uh, a person in my um, county has been doing tutor training, cultural differences have in um, language learning have kind of come last. Okay. And I, and I find that interesting that you put it well before some of the other things. Yes, but actually, if if you look at my session one, I'm going to admit, if you look at that, um, okay, so let's take a look at this. The, we did the tutor interview icebreaker yesterday. The hungry is a menu exercise, which I actually put in your Google Share Drive. We can look at it. Here we're going over how to keep adults motivated to learn. I have an exercise we can do. But if you look at it, we go down a little bit further, Janet. This kind of is all almost more adult age education. And then look, I do have on day two, more of the e e uh, English language learning there, the techniques for teaching English language learning. And the reason I actually did switch it to day two is because if you started on day one, some people that don't feel comfortable working with English language learners may already quit on day one. Oh, okay. I, I'm well, going to admit that. I'm going to admit um, that. <laughs> my county has about uh, 85 to 90% of the uh, students that, that come in want to be English language learners. So we, that's a really important part of our program. Yeah. So you could, that you might want to move up. You might want to do that on day one. Absolutely. You know, and that, and that's okay. I'm just sharing what I found, but when it comes down to it, you have to know your program best. And, and that's, that's a good thing. Um, so are you teaching total physical response? Are you doing TPR? Um, that is mentioned in the training. Yes. Okay. And then not, not to any extent, but it's kind okay. of like, there's a handout about it in your packet. <laughs> okay. I can actually show you a couple of things that um, <laughs> I like to do. I will actually teach a portion of our tutor training in German. Okay. I, I mentioned to you, I'm the first American in my family. My parents are from Germany. Um, and I like to make them feel really uncomfortable because we cannot, we cannot relate a lot of times we cannot relate how that English language learner is feeling. You know, when they go to pronounce um, the English language and they have to form their mouth in these different uncomfortable, unfamiliar ways, right? Um, 
you know, we don't know that unless we're, we're put to the test. So I will sometimes make everybody do German. I will say, first of all, I say, does anybody here speak German? And if they say yes, and I say, I'm going to ask you, please don't share what we're, what we're doing. And then I have everybody pronounce things and they're feeling really uncomfortable. And I say, how did how'd that make you feel? <laughs> you know, and it's kind of like a lesson in empathy. Um, but if anybody speaks another language, I, I think it's great. I, it, that's not my idea. I have to give my mentor, Roberta Rice, credit. Um, she would actually do it in uh, Russian. And she did a great job. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do that in German because that's what I can do. Um, so, and then the, I can, I can actually show you a couple examples of what we do. Okay, so let's go back here for a minute. Um, okay, so I'll just go a little bit over it. So we went, we did the interview icebreaker yesterday. Hungry is a menu exercise. Has anybody ever done the menu exercise? Okay, if you haven't, I've included in your Google Share Drive. I can show you briefly what it is. We literally put up a menu um, and it's half English and half Russian. And we ask you what you're gonna eat and you can't read anything. And it's, it's a whole exercise about coping strategies. How your adult learner will, how they get through life by coping. You know, they might ask the waitress, um, you know, what do you recommend? Or I'll have what he's having. Or, oh, I forgot my glasses. Can you read me the menu? I forgot my glasses. So there's different coping strategies. And that's a great exercise and a, uh, to get people thinking about that. Uh, I did... I do have this in our book. I'd love to go over the how to keep adults motivated to learn. That's an exercise that I've actually done at my trainings and I gave it to you in the in the book. It's in our training training book. Um, but the characteristics of adult learners and the characteristics of good tutors, I love to just have the tutors scream out things and I write it on the board. You know, it gets everybody participating. I like to say, okay, let's talk about what do you think are some characteristics of, of adults adult learners, you know, and they might say, you know, um, determined or brave or scared, you know, and then what are some characteristics of good tutors? And then they might say creative or patient, you know, um, and we literally, I'll just write them all on the, on the board or all on the white flip chart or whatever we're using. And of course, every answer is correct. We want to make everybody feel good because this is how you get everybody involved in the training. And if you can leave them up, sometimes I like to put them on a white paper and, and like tape the white paper up and leave it up there so that they can be remembered of the input that they provided to this training. They have provided input to this training. And it kind of almost gets them, um, I don't wanna say wrapped up in the training, but it kind of does because I've just put their words up and I left it up there. So I love to do little exercises like that um, with the with the tutors, potential tutors. And then we did the learning styles inventory. We did that. Um, so portfolios, if, I, I don't know if any of you are using the Lit Start book. Are you familiar with the Lit Start book? Okay, the Lit Start book um, is put out by New Readers Press. I don't know if you can see this. And I actually have a whole PowerPoint of different resources that we're gonna go over. So this is the Lit Start book and it's put out by the Michigan Literacy uh, Council. And the reason why I love the Lit Start book is it literally talks about everything from how to be a tutor, literally has in there, how do I be a tutor? It has lesson plan ideas. It has um, like, what do you do on your first session with your student? It actually has information on that. Um, it talks about learning disabilities. It talks about sensitivity to light, which I was going to tell you a little bit more about Erlen syndrome. So it it's intended, I've, I've never heard yeah. of it before. So it's, an, it's intended for tutors, not as a curriculum for the learner. Exactly. This okay. is like, I, I don't want to say this is like your Bible for tutors, but yes. Okay. Yes. So um, but it has a lot of strategies in here. So your, your tutor will actually learn like how to, how to create their own mini curriculum. It's not something like um, Laubach or something, you know, that you can just use straight out of the book. This is more like how to be a tutor 
and tips and tricks. What I love in the back is it, is it has so many different appendices. So I'll just give an example. It has vowel sounds. It has um, word families. Remember we talked about the word families? So it has the A, B, AB family, cab, dab, gab, jab, lab, tab. It has, so it has lots of word families. It has um, different lists of word families like beginning, intermediate, advanced. It has, what else does that? I know it has um, compound words. It has long E sounding words like B and fee and C and T. It has um, like the short I. It just has so many great different uh, sight words. It has three different sight words lists. It has um, driving. It even has driving survival words. So yeah, it's got some good stuff. Um, the Lit Start is um, this, whenever I did a new tutor training and I asked for funding from the Florida Literacy Coalition, this is what I asked for, the Lit Start book. Now the Lit Start book, Wait a second, I'm gonna show you something. It has its own little mini assessment, okay? I have put this on your Google Share Drive under assessments because here's the bad thing. When you purchase a Lit Start book nowadays, you no longer get the assessments. I have these forever. So I have scanned them up. They are on your Google Share Drive. Um, the one is, the tutor's guide, and the other one is the reading level assessment. This is so simple that any tutor can do this. This is so simple. The tutors don't have to be scared to do this. Um, and you literally, I print up both the tutor guide and the reading assessment guide for the tutor, and we literally sit and go over it page by page. So for example, um, I'll just tell you real quick. For example, I don't know if you can see this. Can you see it? It has little pictures. So the one page has little pictures and there's like a dog and there's a chair and there's a car and a key and a pair of sneakers and a house and a person reading and a person on the telephone and a person washing their hands. And so if it's an English language learner, here's where you wanna see. Well, first you wanna see, you know, point to the dog. Do they understand what you've just asked them? You know, and then if you ask for the other ones, like what is this person doing? If they say talk phone rather than talking on the phone, you get a little bit better example of their English language um, level. So I, I like the way to let's start. I know it's not really like formal, like the CASAs, but I think it's a good guide for, for your everyday tutor to, to use this. So that's my two cents on the, on the intake. If you have to um, really show more marked gains, you might wanna use something. I have stuck a couple different assessments on the um, under assessments. I have some assessments informal and I have just assessments. I actually put some of the costs up there, which you are allowed to reproduce and use. Um, so that's the, um, the lit start. We talked a little bit yesterday about portfolios. That is definitely a recommendation um, in adult literacy education programs that, you keep, that the learner, the learner be responsible to hold a portfolio on themselves. And anything that you work on, if you work on language experience approach, um, little essays or any writing things, that you date it and keep it in that folder to see progress. And then, um, so the word recognition strategies, we talked about sight words, we talked about phonics. What The way I like to teach phonics is I actually have a couple of slides and I say, you know, the, usually it is the short vowel sounds that learners will struggle with. And that's, a, it's, that's not me saying that, that's like a fact. Um, and the Laubach way to reading does talk, have, a, have good material on short vowel sounds. 
So what I like to say is, I like to say the name of the letter is A. The sound of the letter is A as an apple. The name of the letter is I. The sound of the letter is E as an igloo. The name of the letter is E. The sound of the letter is E as an elephant. The name of the letter is O. The sound of the letter is A ah, as an olive. Um, what did I miss? U. The name of the letter is U. The sound of the letter is A uh, as an umbrella. And you can have your tutors practice that. You can go over phonics. Uh, sometimes I like to say, um, explain phonics if you add a letter, you know, or remove a letter. So let's say, for example, you have the word um, split, S-P-L-I-T, split. What would the let what would the word be if we removed the L? And see, you know, if there's phonics there, can they say spit? Would they understand? Or would they understand if you add an L, there'd be that L sound, split. So there's different things you can do um, with the phonics. The context clues, I there's there's different ways you can do the context clues. You can um the very easiest way to do context clues is to have a sentence and then have your examples underneath. So let's say, for example, uh, a very basic, easy context clue would be, um, there were four blank in the, in the bird's nest. There were four blank in the bird's nest. And then underneath you could have cars, eggs, you know, pencils, and then they, they would have to say it's eggs. They could pick from the list. But there's a lot of information out there on context clues. Um, you know, a very advanced context clues might be blank oranges make the best blank. Blank oranges make the best blank. So would you say Florida oranges make the best juice? Blood oranges make the best snack. So that would be a very advanced way to do a context clues where, and nothing is wrong. So I like to teach context clues, word parts. I told you um, there are lists of the most used prefixes and suffixes out there. Um, I usually give a list like that to my tutors. And then I love the word families and the word patterns. We spend some time on that. Yesterday, I showed you the language experience approach. Um, if you have a chance to look in the Google Share Drive, not only do I have the slide in there that I brought up briefly yesterday, but I have my trainer notes. I wanted you to know that I pretty much write trainer notes on everything for myself. Um, and that's a best practice because even if somebody else, like a colleague of yours wanted to pick it up, they could and teach from that. Uh, I also have the handout, the tutor handout in that folder. So you really could, you could go tomorrow and teach the language experience approach with the PowerPoint, the tutor handout and my notes. And then I don't know if any of you use Proliteracy EdNet. Um, some of their videos, they, okay, their videos are really old. I'm just going to come out and tell you the truth. Their videos are old and you can see the clothing <laughs> that the people wear. You know, you can see that they're dated. Um, they do have a speech sounds and pronunciation video. Sometimes, sometimes I show it, sometimes I don't. Um, the one thing that I really like about it is they do talk about voiced um, consonants. So for example, if you say S or you say Z, S, S versus Z, and you put your hands over your ears, try that, try and do S and then do Z. And you can feel it when you put your hands over your ears. Do you feel how Z is voiced? Z is a voiced, um, is the voiced equivalent of S. It gets really complicated, the speech sounds. I don't always teach it. Um, if you're doing English language, you might wanna do the speech sounds and use that Proliteracy EdNet film. Um, but some of the uh, 
tutors do get a little nervous with it. If anybody wants to know more about the speech sounds, I can send you stuff too, if I, or I can upload it. I haven't uploaded everything because um, there's a lot. Okay, so on day two, on day two, I'm always doing a brief review. I like 10 minutes, I'll say, so yesterday we went over this, we went over the learning styles, we looked at, um, you know, word recognition strategies, and I'm just giving them a quick update. And they're usually nodding their head, and um, it's a good thing. And then I do show the tutor and learner observation first meeting film. I did put it in the Google Share Drive. You do have it there. Um, a trainer tip would be to make sure you have it downloaded on your computer, your laptop. I usually don't ever rely on the cloud or watching it from the web because that's when it usually buffers. And as a trainer, you don't want it to be sitting there buffering and not working and your connection not working. If you have it saved locally on your laptop, um, you're gonna have a lot less problems. So I actually stuck it up there on the Google Share Drive so you can copy it over if you if you wanna use it. Um, the the, I don't know if anybody has seen that film. It's kind of funny. Um, the, the woman, Nancy, is like oblivious to all the things that she does incorrect with the poor learner. Um, but it, it's, it's good because the, you know, the tutors will chuckle a little bit and you can talk about, hey, what did Nancy actually do right? Hey, Nancy showed up. Nancy is dedicated. Nancy tried, you know, um, to kind of make it the atmosphere a little, uh, you know, lighter. So it's 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 an old film, but like I said, it's from Pro Literacy Ednet. Um, I still use it. I still use it. And then I did briefly show some reading comprehension yesterday, um, because one of the participants asked me about the assignment, and I had admitted that this was actually one of our assignments when we took the train. I, I took the train the tutor trainer like three times over the last years, I don't know how many years I, I took it, but um, until, like I said, Roberta Rice was my mentor until um, she actually helped me to teach this course. So uh, I think that would be a great thing for you to get out of this assignment. You know, would you actually create something that you could use? Would you create something that you, you can use um, at a tutor training workshop? You may not have it to the, um, the length, you know, you may want it longer uh, or may add to it, you know, at a future date. But quite a few of our things, graphic organizers was one of my assignments I did for a train the tutor trainer. I still use it, reading comprehension. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind. I always warn the uh, tutors that we're gonna do a, a group photo. Uh, I like to try and submit it to the paper and see if it gets in the paper for some recognition. Um, and then writing strategies. Remember I mentioned that pro-literacy says always teach reading, writing, speaking, listening. Reading, writing, speaking, listening, all at the same time, even with your English language learners. One of the, if you're working with English language learners, it's really important that you even have them listen and have them write down what you say, okay? That can be a lesson in itself is, um, is just hearing that and being able to write down. It may not be spelled 100% correctly, but if you understand what they've written, that's great. With the citizenship um, you know, naturalization exam, that's a requirement. They will actually say something to you like, um, the Liberty Bell is in Philadelphia. If your learner can write that down and it's understandable, but they wrote Philadelphia with an F-I-L, they'll actually still pass. And if, by the way, Florida has phenomenal USCIS, US Citizen Immigration Services people that do fantastic trainings. If you've never taken one of their free uh, tutor trainings, I really highly recommend that you go to the USCIS.gov website and sign up for one. Um, I have worked with two different people in Florida and they would come out to my libraries and do a phenomenal training 
for the general public, but I would always invite my tutors and learners. They would do it on like, um, you know, Immigration 101 or Naturalization 101. And part of it was a wonderful mock interview. So if anybody has English language learners and you're thinking about providing, you know, study help to pass the naturalization exam, definitely work with your USCIS because like I said, they were like gold. And I would make sure I would invite all the tutors. I would say, please, you have to come and hear this. Um, great stuff. Okay, what questions do you have for me? I feel like I'm talking, talking, talking. Um, do I have all your attention? <laughs> I just wanted to um, remind everybody that the citizenship examination is going to be changing somewhat drastically. It has yes, no questions right now and answer six out of 10 or some something. But it's going to that part is going to go to multiple choice questions, but there will not be any tricky multiple choice questions. They'll be pretty straightforward. And oh, that's good. The 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 writing will be the same, the dictation and, and you write, you have writing sentences, but the English language proficiency will be based on the ability to look at a picture or look at several different pictures and comment and it's there's a particular uh functional level i think it's three i don't i'm not real up on on what level but if you can name some things and make some phrases you don't have to use fully complete grammatically correct sentences but you do need to be able to speak to a picture and say you know boy a girl mother grandfather eating lunch shopping probably a little bit more than that, but that's going to be changing. It's in the testing stage right now. And so the requirements will, which exam you get will, will depend on when you filed your application. So. Yeah, they, they are. I remember a few times they've changed it here and there. I think, is it totally on like iPad now too, isn't it? Uh, there, a lot of it's computerized there. Yeah, there isn't any paper, but you're still yeah. going to be working with a person. Yes, so you, yes. Like when you're talking about the picture, you won't be typing your responses. You'll be speaking your responses. Yes, yes. All right. Okay. So, um, so then uh, I mentioned always include writing, a little bit of writing. Uh, temporary spelling is literally you have the learner just write down and not worry uh, as long as the message gets across because we have to get learners writing, whether it's you know writing in everyday life, whether it's a, a letter to their spouse before they leave the house, whether it's you know uh, a note in the child's lunchbox, whether it's, um, you know, a shopping list. So we always talk about writing in everyday life and how can we get our learners to write? Um, and, you know, the everyday scenarios is, is a great one. And like I said, Let's Start really does talk about that. Um, and I, and the reason I have the page numbers here is I literally, well, I have the tutors opening this book constantly. I will say, okay, let's go ahead and open up. Now, remember, I don't have it on their agenda. I don't have it on the tutor's agenda. I just have it on the trainer agenda. And I will say, okay, let's go ahead and let's open up to you know page um, 177 and we're gonna take a look at this. I feel like there were times when I first taught the training and I didn't have them open up the book that much. They let me know about it. So keep that in mind. They would actually write it on the eval. Well, we didn't hardly use the book, you know, so. I learned to make them open that book. So I literally will say, and if you want to know more information, just quickly open up to 176. Let's take a quick look together. And there is the strategy number 50, temporary spelling, a great tool. You know, I will have them just open the book. Even though I've taught it in front of them, 
I will have them still open the book. So that was one thing I learned for many, many years of tutor training. If they didn't touch the book enough, they let me know. <laughs> 